Sul. And then interior for these two states, Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Catarina, interior Paraná, which is sometimes on my uh, slides appears as north interior and sometimes as Paraná interior. And then we have this uh, north coastal, which starts in the Serra do Mar of Paraná and up into Rio de Janeiro. And so um, <clears throat> then we went off and got more Urbanus, thinking, all right, let's test these, these sort of regional groups, throw in more data, see where they fall. So doing this, uh, this is additional. This is just barcode data. We didn't do the AFLP again. And we got everything that we added fit in where we thought it should based on its region of origin. The interesting thing to me in the taxonomic perspective is here is the type locality and the type locality lineage. So, and it is about 15 to 16 percent of our code divergent from all other Urubanus brasiliensis. So if we're going to be strict about taxonomy, that's Urubanus brasiliensis. All the rest of these are something else, or many somethings else. So this is a cryptic species complex. We worked then on the um, morphology, and I just grayed it out to keep you from being bored with tiny type. The res general result is that there is variation, but it's not on this scale of these four regions. There is within region variation that maybe at a finer scale of analysis, we might have morphologically diagnosable little local endemic groups of Urobanus. Um, so we concluded that there's a lot of a very fine scale geographic variation. There's no evidence of introgression in the AFLP markers among the different locations. And there's a lot of, there is not a lot of morphological variation, but what there is does not show oops, any um, correspondence to these large regions like North Interior, South Interior, etc. And we're left with this question, well, what do we do now? You know, uh, so my next step might be to uh, go into a better level of analysis for species delimitation. Okay, so now, what about other earthworms? Because, you know, not all of Brazil has Urubinus brasiliensis, and we should say very little of it does. It's only the top of the Parque Nacional San Andres Organos has Urubinus brasiliensis. This is uh, something published by La uh, Patrick Lavelle and Emmanuel Lapquet, who both work extensively on earthworms in South America. And they looked at what group, groups of these, uh, with this all insects, were local and what were regional in Amazonian forests that they sampled. And earthworms were about, this down here is actually a red part. Um, earthworms are about 95% local. That is very limited endemism in the Amazon forest, which we you know, often think of as this great, more or less homogeneous area or with large subregions that are you know, sort of extensive. And in regions of low topographical complexity, we typically don't find very localized endemic earthworms. But here in the Amazon, we do. So what more can we find? Um, is this high endemism or just bad sampling? Um, in the records of earthworms of Brazil, of the 200 odd, almost 300 native species now, uh, most of them are known from only one or two places, and those one, or, if there are two, they are generally quite close to each other. And most are restricted to small areas. They have, we believe, low dispersal ability, though so there's maybe some variation uh, on that, depending on the habitat type. So aquatic worms and in worldwide seem to be better at it. And earthworms that are uh, specific to bromeliads as a habitat may have a different dispersal mechanism. And there are very few widespread species that upon closer examination turn out actually to be the same species. So, um, <clears throat> part of our, our sampling, again, you can just go by color here uh, and branch form. These are um, barcode samples from 
uh, two genera that are closely related, Femoscolex and Guasoscolex. They're confined to south and southeastern Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and Uruguay. But uh, these are all southeastern Brazil. Um, so again, the pattern is long branches with little clusters from local spots at the ends. Uh, very few exceptions, you know, maybe something like this, but still that's a fairly long branch. And there we have some shorter ones. So this is a kind of typical earthworm barcode divergence tree. You know, birds and butterflies are about one or two percent. This is ten times. So if we assume a, a common rate of molecular evolution for this gene, this is on the order of, you know, seven to ten million years ago divergence events for the deeper branches. Uh, simplifying that a little bit um, and adding a couple of other taxa, I just want to draw your attention to uh, these three things. First, these are a member of the Ochnerodrility that live in uh, arboreal habitats, typically bromeliad leaf tanks. And these are three places. Bocaina is a, a mountain area, and a, a preserved area in Sao Paulo, and not very far away from that is Baranal. Uh, also in Sao Paulo, and Itamonche is um, on the border of Minas Gerais and Rio de Janeiro, near the a big national park, Itatiaia. These guys live up in the trees in Bromil Um <clears throat> Now, here we have two sites close together, or maybe a kilometer or two apart at the most, and some divergence within that. And then Itamonte here. Um, in the F refers to forests. This, this, this one is a, from the forest. This one is from a pasture. So we parked the car. We walked across down a little short road. We crossed a river that was, you know, roughly from that chair to Tom, or a little, so, or a little wider. We went into the woods. We found some worms. We walked back out to the car. George said, "Let's dig over here in this cow pasture." And we found one of the same species, and that's it. So this is 500 meters and a, and a small river, and detectable geographical signal. So what I'm saying as earthworms as um, accessible organisms for doing stuff is you don't need to drive long distances. You don't need to do very much. You, you can find you know, a hill here and a hill there and earthworms in it, and they're not all pontospolex you can get local geographical signal on a, an afternoon field trip sampling earthworms, and we'll help you. So that's the, the message for this bit. We've got um, lots of localized, narrow endemics with small ranges. You know, there doesn't appear to be any environmental driver there. There's probably a lot of speciation without selection going on. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what we have from Mata Atlantica. We're expanding into other areas, but uh, it's probably going to be very simple. And so you can do a lot of uh, quick, low-cost detection of you know, geographical variation, uh, look at barriers, you know, where the river is or where the river was, that kind of stuff, in your own home area. And uh, next, this is uh, another pitch for Another project, this is the Terra Preta do Indio. Uh, these are Amazon dark earths in English. And uh, we're studying the uh, soil fauna of dark earths and neighboring non-dark earth sites and uh, hoping to find things about earthworms that relate to that. Pontoscolex corythurus is very common in those areas. And we think it may have something to do with pre-colonization by human, uh, by Europeans, transfers and movements of people and agricultural materials in the Amazon region, and accidentally, perhaps, carrying earthworms. So we want your Pontos Golex, and this is the story. Um, you send us an email, we'll provide you with instructions and help with identification as from, from before you go to the field. And then uh, send an email, this one, network at gmail.com, and uh, we'll send back the story that your samples contributed to. Okay, I think I have probably run through my half hour. And I'll stop there. I'll put that slide back up just in case anybody will actually do this. Thank you. <coughs>
Thank you very much. Yeah, I guess it's time.